Welcome uh, to everybody. We're starting uh, the session of uh, Study Club. This session will be recorded, uh, uh, will be made available uh, for people who couldn't uh, attend uh, the event. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm very glad to uh, present uh, the two speakers. Today's speakers are Dr. Ricardo Enriquez and Dr. Luigi Vito Stefanelli. They will have uh, 25 minutes time presentation for each speaker. And I'm asking uh, the participants to write up their questions on chat. The chat is uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the icon on, on the control panel. You find the icon on the control panel, you can write up the, the questions. That question will be read at the end of the presentations. It will be 10, 15 minutes at the end for questioning. I will introduce you the first speaker, but before doing that, I'm briefly uh, talking about uh, the dynamic navigation concept, uh, which will be addressed uh, by the following two uh, speakers. And we're talking about a, a, a logic which is behind the GPS, so tracking uh, movements. So GPS is tracking our movements on and putting uh, those move movements on the map with uh, Navident, the Micron Tracker technology, which is a proprietary technology by Claronav, enables the tracking of uh, uh, tags fixed on the contrangle and uh, fixed on the patient mouth. Those movements, thanks to the software, get superimposed on a software and, uh, and specifically on a CBCT, the patient CBCT, then allowing uh, the user to see what it does on the patient anatomy in real time. This is what it takes to use dynamic navigation. So without any further ado, I'll introduce you the first speaker. The first speaker is a Dr. Ricardo Neriques. He comes from Porto, Portugal. He's got a degree in dentistry and is postgraduate in advanced biometric oral rehab. He's been the first user in Portugal is currently the vice president uh, of the Dynamic Navigation Society, which is a society which basically uh, unites all uh, uh, enthusiasts uh, uh, about dynamic navigation. And uh, last but not least is a, a master clinical trainer. In other words, is the one who takes responsibility for training uh, uh, newcomers on this new technology. I uh, will make myself uh, the presentation and I will ask eventually Dr. Neresh to um, uh, uh, guide me on, uh, on the presentation. I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, activate okay. the presentation and uh, from now onward, word to Dr. Neresh and I will follow you to your, your command. Okay, thank you everyone and i hope you are all in good health you and your family you can pass to the next slide uh, this is a uh, an article about the the security of using piezoelectric devices for uh, sinus elevation next slide please and we uh, can, we can go to the next slide. It's the, the conclusion. Before that, it's not appearing. No. So the conclusion is that uh, piezoelectric devices are safer for sinus L elevation. Maybe the the slide is not uh, configured in your computer, uh, Luca. Okay. Well, don't worry. Don't worry. We'll. Uh... We'll keep going. I don't know if the slides that have text will happen to, to all of them. This is the case. We have uh, already sinus elevation on the, the right side, and we are going to make uh, it on the left side using piezoelectric and um, the, the Navident system. We plan, uh, this is the sinus, we plan here um, 
on the Navident the software, the window on lateral approach. And uh, we will do that uh, marking three points with the Navident on the bone. You can put the, the video now. Okay. Let me, it's uh, the video, the first video. Uh, the Navident video. Yes. So we choose the, the implant for the implant format and we are going to mark to put uh, three implants on the three points we want to make the the marks for the window we put the implants as short as we can and then we put them perpendicular to the bone to the bone wall We can make three or four points and then we are going to connect them with the, with the piezo. The three, I make, uh, made three points, one in the bottom and two uh, in the upper part of the window. And I put them perpendicular to the bone wall. I will adjust the bottom one because it's uh, too down. I want it a bit upper. And we can control on the 3D image. Now the bottom one a bit upper. The ideal uh, for me is uh, three millimeters from the, the floor of the, the sinus. Then we have the normal process from the Navident software. The tracing, the all the norm, normal process. The accuracy check is always very, very important. So we can decide if we go further off or if we go back to redo some step, to repeat some step. The accuracy was very good. Although we had a few teeth only. Then we can calibrate the tool tip, the piezo tip. And again, check accuracy. It was very good. And then we mark the three points. We cut the bone in the three points. It's important. The entrance point, on this case, it's not important, the direction. Uh, we are working uh, back there on the sinus and direction. Sometimes it's not easy, but it's not important. And we cut the bone on the three spots. Okay, we can go back to the presentation. So we had the uh, three implants on the interior zone with the uh, metalloacrylic teeth. You can go further. Yes, the slides with text are not uh, configured. Maybe I, I can try to explain without the text. Yes. Uh, can yes. you go further? So we are connecting the jaw uh, tracker to, to the jaw with the composite. You can go further. It's connected and well, uh, it's not moving. You can go further. So you can see and it doesn't touch the patient. It only touches the, the point where it is connected. Can go further. So this is the calibrator. Another view, we can go further. Another view of the calibrator. And it can be can go to the autoclave. That's very important. 
you can go to the next slide this is text okay this is the point where it is um, where we put the tracer you can go further and this is the normal procedure that as you saw in in the video to mark the landmarks and make the, all the registration you can go further this is text and this is the the end piece uh, tracker connected to the piezo end piece you can go further this is the um, calibrating of the piezo tip you can go further and uh, when you open the flap from now on you will be using the guidance uh, from navident to tell you exactly where you mark the points so you can make the window exactly where you planned it in this case maybe it wasn't so difficult for us to find the, the correct position of the window but in, in some cases where you have a septum or uh, other accidents on the bone, it can be very important to have the exact point points where you want to cut. You can go further. And now uh, we are maybe on this image making the accuracy check. You can go further. And we are cutting, being guided by the uh, Navident system. We already have uh, a cut in there, you can go further. Uh, I, don't, I don't control the mouse here, but you can see uh, a point there where he, there is a small cut. Yes, yes, there. You can go further. So the, the instrument is showing the, the cutting, yes. You can go further. Another cut. You can go further. And you start connecting. I tried to connect the, the points using Navident and it works, but it's much easier once you have the three points marked to cut, to connect the dots uh, by direct vision you can choose one or another i like uh, to to do it by direct vision uh, connecting yes can go further and here all the points are already connected uh, nowadays when i do this uh, connection i cross the lines on the edges because uh, I can uh, get much more sure uh, that the, the, the bone has been cut uh, um, all the way down to the sinus. You can go further. Now we can use this piezo tip to to pull the, the window bone inside and to start uh i don't know how you say in english to do, to separate the membrane from the bone uh, inside i usually maintain the window bone on on the membrane it goes inside and it will be the the ceiling of the augmentation you can go further i used creos in this situation and uh, some uh, collagen uh, cubes. You can go further. This is question again with liquid PRF uh, that I put inside. And here I am using the, the collagen blocks first to, to hold up the the ceiling of the, the the membrane of the sinus some more collagen can go yes and then i put i've put the creos bone you can go further 
Yes, then I put some uh, PRF membranes and suture. You can go further. There was text in here. So this is what I got just after the sinus augmentation. We can see a line of the membrane. I don't have the, the mouse here, but you can see all the line of the membrane. Yes, up, up on the upper on the upper uh, part. Okay, you can go further now. Uh, uh, if you see, can you go back, Luca? If you see on the image below, you can see there are some areas that uh, are more uh, less radio transparent on the images down that's the, the parts where you have the where we have the um, the collagen blocks i'm just going to connect i was trying this so trying not to have so uh, such a dense material on the sinus and to see if I could get the more bloody bone when when I went with the implants. So you can go further. This is maybe four months later. You can see the upper uh, the ceiling of the the sinus augmentation went a bit down because of the compression of the collagen. Can go further. And this is some months uh, later. So we can see on the image below that uh, it's not so dense as when I put only bone. And this is the, the comparison of uh, the before and the after. On the middle, we have the alignment of the same position the before and the after. You can go further. Uh, and an implant placed uh, after the, the formation of the bone. And we are now, now uh, we, we made the impressions to, to put the crowns. So this is a, a bit disconfigurated. We have here the some steps. We transfer CVCT to the Navident software. We analyze CVCT. We decide where we want the window, the exact position. We choose three or four strategic dots to plan the design of the window. We virtually plan three or four small implants with the shortest diameter and the perpendicular to the bone wall. Uh, with direction vestibular to palatal. Uh, we move the implants on the several image cuts of the Navident software to the desired position. Uh, we choose the piezo tip. Uh, the best piezo tip uh, I have tried is the, a diamond saw with notice. It makes a fast cut and with less risk. You can go further, Luca. We insert the tip parallel to the end piece tag. Uh, it's easier to, to use the, the system. Uh, we do the Navident trace and place regular registration. We do the flap, the tip calibration with the calibrator. And we do the accuracy test. Then we do the, guide, the guided surgery. We mark the three or four dots that we have planned on the exact position on the bone until the total perforation of, of the bone. And uh, I like to use direct vision from now on and I cut the bone making the perimeter of the window by connecting the dots. And uh, on the edges, on, uh, on the dot points, uh, it's better to cross the lines. And then the sinus elevation usual procedures.
and uh, I think that's it. There is the other video if you want to show it, it's just the, the sinus membrane moving. It's a, a normal situation just to see it. It has the bone attached. It's just that. Okay, Dr. Enrique, thanks for your presentation. I, Welcome. I take back uh, the uh, right presentation and I will introduce you next our next and last speaker, which is a Dr. Luigi Stefanelli. He is a, an engineer. He has an engineering degree from Politecnico Torino, along with a, a degree in dentistry and a PhD at the University of Roma. Is a professor of master in ontology and prosthesis uh, at the university in Rome. He has been the first Navident user in Italy and is currently the president uh, for Dynamic Navigation Society. He himself is a master clinical trainer and is a, an author and inventor of uh, different uh, patents in a, a study guided surgery. So, without any further ado, I bestow presentation right uh, to Dr. Luigi Stefanelli. He can start sharing his own screen. Okay, Luca, could you share again the screen? Luca. Luca. Unmute your... Uh... Okay. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, let's start. Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, good morning to Darrell. And thanks to all to be here this afternoon to share this webinar. The title of this webinar is the use of the pterygoid implants for the treatment of the posterior atrophic maxilla with a minimal invasive approach and as alternative to short implants, zygomatic implants or sinus slit. Placing an implant in the posterior atrophic maxilla is a challenge because of poor bone in terms of quantity. In fact, as you well know, the loss of superior posterior teeth leads to a resorption of the alveolar bone crest and the pneumatization of the maxillary sinus and also in terms of quality in fact in this area the bone density is d3 d4 last but not least the surgical access in this area could be difficult the insertion of an implant in poor bone quality has been demonstrated to have an a, a, a higher rate of failure. In fact, 
as you can see in this in this slide, Jaffin and Berman reported a, dirty, a 35 percent of failure rate for implants placed in bone quality type four, in contrast to a failure of three percent for conventional implants placed in bone of type one, two, or three. The role of implants in poor bone in um, poor bone uh, density um, and in particular the implant length seems to matter less on stress distribution with the exception of implant loaded in poor bone quality where length appears to be more important factor and affects success rate. In fact, in this study, Bashi and other colleagues found that longer implants, 15, 18 millimeters, had a higher survival rate, it does 94%, than shorter implants, 88%, in type D4 bone. So, Several techniques have been described for the placement of implants in the posterior atrophic maxilla, and they are sinus slip, zygomatic implants, and short implants. What I want to share with you today is an alternative procedure with the use of dynamic navigation, and it is to place an implant in the pterygoid area. Toulas and Tessier were the first to describe the technique for pterygoid implants. In 1989, they reported that atrophic posterior maxilla preserve 80% of the original bone corridor, and this is enough to insert a 13-20 millimeter long implant. These uh, uh, pterygoid implants and their insertion involve three bones but one anatomical area and these three bones are the maxillary tuberosity the pyramidal process of the palatine bone and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone you can see in this slide with the three different colors these three bones the maxillary tuberosity the pyramidal process of the palatine bone here in blue, and then the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. So, the advantages to use pterygoid implants minimal invasive approach, non bone grafting, predictable, avoid posterior prosthetic cantilevers, shorter period of treatment, stable during the time. In fact, in a recent review of the literature, Araujo and other colleagues reported 94% of a cumulative survival rate in a period over 10 years. So it is very stable during the time. And the lost, and the lost implants, almost of them, uh, they, it was because uh, the malpositioning of implants, so before the loading. Immediate loading is possible and decreasing of the cost for the patient and dentist. So the question each one of us is asking probably is why pterygoid implant has not been widely used if there are all of these advantages. There are two important factors that represent a limit to the spread of this procedure. One is the freehand insertion of a long implant, 15, 20 millimeters, in a high risk anatomic area with the semi blinded procedure. And from a prosthetic standpoint, tilted posterior implants can also be difficult to restore compared to vertical oriented fixtures. But before to dig deeper into the surgical technique, Let's have a look into this area. In fact, for the placement procedures of these implants, it is essential to have a thorough knowledge 
of an atom involved because nearby vital structure can be injured during surgery. It is the, the step that I call preoperative evaluation. So in this slide, you can see the pterigo maxillary posta. Here, you can see pro probably my mouse. Okay. Then the most cranial point of the pterigo maxillary fissure and the most caudal point of the, this, uh, uh, this joint. Here you see the internal maxillary artery that cross the pterigo maxillary fossa above one centimeter, 10 millimeters above the most cranial point of the pterigo maxillary joint. This uh, uh, length from the most cranial point to the most caudal point of the pterigo maxillary joint is our available bone to insert the implant in the pterygoid plate. And this distance is estimated to be more or less 13 millimeters, 14 millimeters. Okay. When the maxillary artery arrives into the pterygomaxillary fossa, there is one of its terminal branch that is called descending palatine artery. This descending palatine artery goes in, uh, through the greater canal, the greater palatine channel, and arrives into the and emerges into the oral cavity from the greater palatine foramen. The mediolateral distance of this joint of this available bone is estimated to be 9.5 millimeters. The Anterior posterior distance is about 6.5 millimeters. So, in this slide, you can see other images of the palatine of the descending palatine artery. Here, the pterygomaxillary fossa, the pterygomaxillary fissure, and the lateral process of the pterygoid plate and the medial process of the pterygoid plate. These uh, are the images from an article um, of Graves, 1984. And you can see the tuberosity of the maxilla, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid. It is a very important uh, landmark and uh, in a few slides i can uh, tell you why this landmark is important for our surgery so let's have a look to surgical procedures the posterior sinus wall the pterygoid apophysis and the palatine bone guide the position of the pterygoid implant the major danger is a damage to the palatine to the descending palatine artery due to the malpositioning of the pterygoid implant. Other images of the Graves article of the Graves paper, you see the extension here of the sinus floor and the available height, height under the sinus floor determine determine the coronal starting point, usually the second molar, and the angulation of the implant direction. If you proceed the freehand, a full thickness incision is made a few millimeters medial to the crest of the porosity from the pterygomaxillary fissure to the premolar area. But uh, yes, we spoke about some landmarks that are important to establish the direction of our pilot drill. 
the amular process of the medial pterygoid process is palpated in the oropharynx. And this process guides the clinician to determine the thickest part of the pterygoid pillar of the bone, usually in the central part of the two processes. Here, okay, is the amular process. Usually, five millimeter lateral from the amular process and 10, 14 millimeters above the most caudal, above the most caudal point of the pterygomaxillary suture, we have this thickest part of the pterygoid plate. Yes, it is also possible to extend the apex of the implant one, two millimeters in the pterygoid fossa where we have just some pterygoid muscles and some little artery and but not vital structure here our preoperative evaluation that is always important and we see the distance between the greater palatine channel from our planned pterygoid implant we have seen the surgical technique prehend, and we affirmed that one of the factors that limit the use of this technique is connected to make this procedure prehend. Verkruisen and other colleagues compared accuracy using the static guides and freehand, mental navigation. As you can see in this slide, with the mental navigation, we have an apical error of about three millimeters with 10 degrees as angular deviation. If you imagine that uh, this is for the standard, for the conventional implant, that are 10 millimeters, but if you consider a pterygoid implant that is 20 millimeters sometimes, this uh, deviation could be six millimeters. And uh, so you can. Uh, easily understand why this technique is quite difficult to be performed freehand. But now we have an opportunity that is the use of dynamic navigation system. As you know very well, this system works like a GPS with the micron tracker technology, these two eyes could make a triangulation always between our drill and the, the jaw to be treated. So we can follow on the screen the position of the drill advancing in the bone. But there is another great advantage. In this case, it's, it's, it's very important that you can make an accuracy check in each step. So you can be sure that your surgery is safe and how accurate is uh, this system in this slide you can see um, a paper uh, that was written uh, by me and other colleagues uh, my great friend uh, george mandelaris and was published in on johnny as you can see the apical duration is uh, one millimeters and the angular deviation is about two millimeters and twenty five two millimeters and fifty this is but the ap apical deviation is about one millimeter also for the trace and trace technology this article appeared uh, during this month and the, and the, it is the future article of the international journal of periodontics and the restorative dentistry you can see the same result, one millimeter, 2.5 degrees as angular error. But let's have a look to the most important article on dynamic navigation systems that uh, uh, are presented in literature. You can see the same values in, term, in terms of apical deviation, one millimeter, that is much more or less than three millimeters by using the free hand. Here you see um, a case, 
uh, yes, a partially dentulous case. So, so, so for a short span prosthesis in which I planted two implants, one traditional implant and one pterygoid, and uh, I uploaded also the digital which walks up that is very important to make a prosthetic driven implantology planning, then the accuracy check, and then my osteotomy. Yes, as you can see, I can follow, I can follow the drill during its advancing in the bone, but I'm sure because my accuracy check was 0.0, that I'm doing a very accurate and safe surgery. And this is the X-ray at the end of the surgery. And uh, these are the values of deviation, 0 0.85 degrees, 2.31, not so bad. In, in this case, I want to show you an important thing, the importance of digital WhatsApp. This, this patient come, came into my dental office, I scanned him and I planned the, uh, the implants without a digital WhatsApp. And for sure, I made an accurate surgery. You see, four frontal implants, straight, and two pterygoids. Also, the Valunav reported a very accurate deviation, 2.19 degree, 2.11, 0 0.81, 2.05. 1.84, 2.36, But if you, this is the provisional, some hours later, but if you look my gypsum cast, you can see that the implants are not placed with the prosthetic driving implantology concept. So it is uh, always important to have a digital WhatsApp if you want to make an accurate and correct planning. So this was a mistake. This is uh, the, yes, the, 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 the provisional. Okay, and this is the final work. Now my approach is different. This is a, a patient who asked for a, a full implant prosthetic treatment. I made, an intraloral scanner impression, and then I prepared a stent, a digital stent with some radiopack landmarks. The check of my digital walks up, just to be sure that everything is correct. Then just two days before the surgery, I insert some mini screw, Yes, make the, the CBCT. This time I prepared an accurate planning by using my digital WhatsApp as a reference. Then uh, here I used these screws as a reference, as a landmark in order to um, align the CBCT with the, the uh, arch to be treated. The software automatically recognized this uh, mini screw. And then the accuracy check, another time 0, 0.0. So here the osteotomy of the two pterygoids and the other implants. Here is the, the Panorex after the CBCT, yeah, and the accuracy. Also in this case, the accuracy was not so bad. Now I want to show you what happened, especially in the upper jaw when we make the osteotomy navigated, but we make the insertion of the implant prehand, not navigated. Here is the planning. Also, another time, the digital walks up with the, the landmarks. Uh, 
okay? The solving and the planning, the tracing, the accuracy check, another time 0, 0.0, the calibration of drill axis and the drill tip, another accuracy check and the endosteotomy. Another time, very accurate for the pterygoid from the other two implants. This is the, the situation at the end of the surgical procedure. You can see a minimal invasive approach. This is the panorex at the end of the surgery, but look, yes, we were accurate, but not so accurate as the previous cases. So my recommendation is also to use the dynamic navigation is, uh, system, not only for the osteotomy, but also for the insertion of the implants. And this is another case in which one side was performed by freehand and the other side was performed by dynamic navigation surgery. Right side freehand, left side by dynamic navigation surgery. Here is the planning. Okay, you can see freehand accuracy of the pterygoid on the right side, 13.81 degrees. The second implant, 4.61 degrees and 17.29 degrees. When we used the dynamic navigation system, 0 0.64 degrees, 0 0.65 degrees, 1.78. You can see that there is a, no history. Placing implant with the dynamic navigation system is much more accurate. Here there is a, a paper that has been approved on the International Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry and is related to the insertion of the pterygoid implants by using dynamic navigation surgery in the partially edentulous patients. I inserted 31 implants by using dynamic navigation uh, guide and 32 freehand for a total of 63 implants. As you can see, I uh, add the integration ratio of 100% by using dynamic navigation, but I lost two implants due to malpositioning by using freehand. And these are the accuracy reported at coronal, apical 3D, apical depth, and as angular error. You can see 2.60 degrees and 1.27 millimeters as apical deviation. If we look at the insertion of freehand, we had 12.64 degrees and 2.57 millimeters as apical deviation. Then also the mucosa thickness above the pterygoid implants was evaluated. And these values has been reported to be more than five millimeters with a maximum of 9.4 millimeters. So what I suggest is to have a soft tissue plastic at the time of the surgery. Also the distance between the planned implants and the greater palatine channel, not artery because we see on the CBCT the channel, not the artery, is uh, was 3.48 millimeter. The implant length used, yes, most of all was 34 in uh, 15 millimeters in 34 cases, it does 5.4%. And if you look at the multi unit abutment used, we used 30 degrees multi-unit abutment for the majority of the pterygoid implants. 
just five cases, I used a customized multi-unit abutment. If you look at the t-test to evaluate if there was a difference, a statistically significant difference between the means by using freehand or navident, you see that navident show, showed obviously that uh, exerted a statistical significant influence on these values. Okay, so another time the conclusion. The rigoid implants could allow to the clinician several advantages. So my suggestion is to use it, them with the use of the dynamic navigation system. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Stepanelli, for sharing a, a wonderful presentation and uh, allowing us to better understand uh, the whole concept of uh, dynamic navigation applied to uh, pterygoid implants. So now we do have a few minutes left for questioning. I, I do have, a, I collect a few questions myself and uh, I invite uh, the audience eventually to write up theirs on the chat that uh, it's found on the, on the control panel. So my questioning uh, uh, for um, both of you, and uh, I will uh, start uh, first with uh, Dr. Enriquez. So um, uh, uh, the question for Dr. Enriquez is the following. Uh, um, in terms of uh, uh, preparation time before surgery, before actually doing the surgery, you mentioned about uh, tracing uh, and the preparation of, uh, of the system. How long does it take before jumping into action and using uh, the system on a piezo surgery? If you can, uh, uh, if you can uh, uh, provide us with an answer, Dr. Enriquez. Uh, are you listening to me? Yes, yes, we can. Yes. Uh, I didn't measure the time, but I think maybe less than 10 minutes to okay. make all so, the preparation uh, so the, the the usage of navident affect uh, the day-to-day uh, -day usage or the day-to-day -day surgery compared to the to the experience you had uh, without navident so what's the difference of using navident in your surgery compared yes. to not using it you 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 win a lot of time because um, when doing the surgery with Navident, you go directly to the points that you planned. When you don't have Navident, you must find uh, some structures to where to, um, to locate the window. And sometimes you are not very sure of the positions you are looking for. And uh, you have to open a bigger flap and you have to it's not so so direct when you start the the surgery with navident you go directly to the points and you know you are there you don't have any doubts so that's a big a big change good good let me ask you another question do you need a special piezo or you can adapt the system to the currently available system or or hand pieces as long as I, as I know, you can use uh, on every system. I don't think there is a big difference on the the end piece and the Navident uh, way of connecting the tag to the to the end piece. Uh, I think it's usable with every every brand. Okay. Yep. Good. So another question uh, for, uh, again, thanks for the wonderful uh, pictures and uh, images that you share with us, Dr. Enrique. I'm sorry for the, the disconfiguration of the text no, because no, my no, system no, is different from no, yours. Uh, so, everybody understood very well uh, the concept okay. uh, that you shared with us. So well, well uh, taken. So question to Dr. Stefanelli. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, you discourage, you not recommend not to navigate 
implants on the upper jaw. What about the lower jaw? Are you currently uh, navigating implants on the lower jaw or are you just uh, doing the osteotomies? No, no, I use uh, also in the lower jaw the dynamic navigation for the insertion of the implants. But uh, as you know, the bone, the density of the bone is, uh, is uh, much more important in the lower jaw. So it affects not at the same uh, way the, um, the insertion of the implants. Okay. The taper is so, eh? yeah. Another question is uh, um, between uh, an all on four technique and uh, your technique using dynamic navigation, why you use uh, uh, you know, uh, dynamic uh, versus uh, the all on four? When, uh, what, what is your thought process uh, in using one with the other instead of the other? Yes, I want to insert always six implants when I can. So uh, I always found a, um, a space to insert the two pterygoid implants. So when I can, I always use four frontal implants and two pterygoid. Okay, so another question is, uh, is the width of the mouth opening uh, from the patient side uh, a limit to this technique? Can you answer Dr. Rare Rikesh? Yeah, 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 it could be a limit. But uh, if you plan the implant tilted, the pterygoid implant tilted, and you use uh, the prosthetic, uh, the prosthetic component of uh, the, the the rain, for example, that are straight multi-unit abutment, the OT bridge, OT equator. I don't know if uh, they 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 know the this system. You can uh, correct the this parallelism by using the straight uh, multi-unit abutment and uh, if you put a, a tilted implants the, um, the limitation of the mouth opening could be uh, jumped but uh, uh, always it is important to evaluate which is uh, the opening of the mouth because sometimes you can decide not to have a full arch because, uh, for example, there is a limitation of the opening uh, of the mouth. But uh, yes, it is an important uh, uh, evaluation that the clinician need to do before the planning. Okay, thank you. So now a question for, to both of them. Both of you are trainers. You are master clinical trainers with regards to uh, the newcomers, the people who are colleagues of yours who are approaching uh, the systematic. So according to your experience, and you've been uh, the first, you, know, uh, you started using Navident uh, since a long time. I mean, it's, I mean we're talking about uh, uh, four years, three years ago. So you've been, train, you've been uh, training uh, uh, different colleagues, many, many colleagues of yours. According to your experience, uh, talking also f with uh, with your colleagues, what is uh, the learning curve that you encountered yourself as a users, and what is the learning curve that you seen as an as a as a witness uh, for those who are approaching uh, uh, the uh, systematic uh, the technique uh, from zero? If you can provide me an answer each, so if we can start with the first with Dr. Enriquez, and then with uh, Dr. Stefanelli. So what's your what's the reasoning uh, for that? Well, uh, for me, the learning curve was uh, pretty easy because I, I really liked the system. I, I was really um, doing, how can I say it? When you like something, you, you make an effort to change the way you were thinking before, right? And that's yeah. the... the the difficult part for those ones that don't fall in love right at the beginning with with the system uh, like everything in life when you, when you change uh, that's human nature you have some difficulties to to treat change but if you really like it you go for it and then you get to a point when you uh, are uh, confident 
and uh, everything will be better than before that's the changing thing it's it's the part that can be difficult for some some colleagues but for me it was really easy be because i really liked it okay good i totally agree with ricardo but if uh, i i have to 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 give you a number i could say i should say 50 implants are the are the numbers of implants that uh, are enough to jump the learning curve yeah um, uh, there's another question if you talk to colleagues who are well trained in using studying navigation system 3d planned surgical system can you highlight advantages uh, of dynamic navigation in terms of easiness reliability and clinical use so can you talk a little bit about uh, the difference between static and dynamic navigation yeah, yeah there are a lot of advantages one is uh, for example that uh, you works with uh, without uh, um, any obstacles in the mouth uh, you can uh, use your uh, technique um, like uh, freehand you can uh, see on the screen what you are doing you can see if you are accurate um, you can use uh, with the partially dentalus patient uh, the cbct that uh, uh, already has the the, the patient um, for example in the posterior uh, side of the mouth you are you have no limitation other but uh, sometimes with the static guide you have to consider the thickness the, the thickness of the surgical guide also when you have uh, uh, when you have to insert an implant for example in the lateral incisor upper incisor uh, sometimes the space of the master tube is uh, is wider of the space you have so you cannot use the surgical guide but with the use of dynamic navigation you can perform also these uh, these, these cases when the, the the two teeth are so tight and uh, also there is no limitation on the diameter of the implants sometimes when you use a static guides you have a limitation on the diameter of the um, of the of the implant that could be used and it depends on the, the, the diameter of the master tubes. The irrigation is another important thing. That you, you are uh, another important advantage is that is dynamic. So, for example, if you decide to, to insert an implant in another position in, during your surgery, the dynamic navigation system allows to you to do this. With the surgical guide after your planning the surgery is uh, what you planned no other changes could be done okay. well Enrique, she would you would like, yes, add anything else on that yeah yeah St stefanelli uh, pointed almost everything i can i can add uh, one thing uh, for a case like the one i presented if you try to use uh, a static uh, navigation guide it will be disturbing your surgery more than helping because you are working on the posterior side on the lateral it would be i think almost impossible to use a static guide for that technique that i presented you and dynamic navigation is perfect for for it and uh, in many cases i think when you are uh, struggling with the uh, lack of space, uh, static navigation only gets in the way. And uh, with dynamic navigation, it will help you because patient doesn't even have to open the mouth so, so much than uh, freehand. Okay, good, thank you. Uh, there's a, <clears throat> another question. Uh, according to your best knowledge, what's the the advantages, what are the advantages of choosing a Navident against the competition? 
What do you what do you think? Are there is a great advantage that is the elimination of the stent, the radiological stent, the trace and place technology. All the other dynamic navigation systems use a radiological stent before the CBCT. Okay, someone of us can say, okay, I want to to make my personal CBCT. I'm, I'm not interested in using a CBCT that the patient already has, but there is a, a, an important advantage of, of trace and place technology. If you prepare a stent, you make the CBCT, but if the position of the stent is different when you close the mouth, the position of uh, uh, the, the opening the mouth, it it ends with an error that uh, could not be repaired <laughs> uh, you can repair it but you you have to remake another cbct so the use of the teeth or the remaining teeth as a landmark to register the cbct is a great advantage is a great advantage and no other dynamic navigation system has this technology. Okay. Maybe, maybe we could say the, the tips, the, um, the end pieces where we can connect. I don't, I don't think other systems have yeah. so many a variety of end pieces where you can uh, use like piezo and other other end pieces yeah and uh, and the um, how can you say it it's a smaller system that you can take from one clinic to another some some of them can you can do that and and all the the bet that the navident is is always evolving always uh, getting new new things constantly. Yeah, good. So I I, I mean, looking at the at the watch, I'll uh, I'll call the uh, study club session. Uh, and by calling it, I want to first of all uh, thank heartfully the two speakers, Dr. Enriquez and Dr. Stefanelli. Thanks for having shared your wonderful uh, images of the cases. I think we're very, very uh, instructive and, uh, and uh, really um, help us to understand quite a big deal about dynamic navigation. I also want to thank uh, the participants who actually had uh, the chance to attend uh, the event. I, as I said, uh, we are recording a, a session that will make it available uh, through social media. And I simply, um, I will uh, invite uh, all of you to come to the third event that uh, we uh, will be organizing uh, in May, still in, uh, in English. It will be an English session and will be uh, a study club. And I will invite uh, all existing users and, uh, and uh, future users eventually to start sharing their own experiences with the other colleagues, because that will be very instructive, very learning uh, for, for everybody. So thanks again and uh, all the best. All the best. Thank you. All the best. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye. Appreciate it. All the best. Stay safe.